Okay, so today we have uh, the second uh, of uh, the four, uh, four lecture series by um, Sir Michael, and the title of the talk uh, today is uh, Drag Dirac Operators. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, yesterday I talked about the elementary proof of the Bott periodicity theorem, which is the foundation stone for the topological um, development follows from that, which has uh, an important application in particular to the theory of index theory of elliptic operators. And today I'll sort of show you how that connection comes about, the fundamental link. Uh, I won't develop all the theory, but I'll show you, how, show you how it starts. And then I'll make some, after that will be the first half of the talk, in the second half of the talk, I will say some things about the real case, where I mentioned the bot periodicity theorem in the complex case, which is what I talked about, had just period two, as we mentioned in questions, in the real case, it has period 8, which is more subtle. There are some integers modulo 2, and I'm going to talk about those parts in relation with analysis. They give a rather nice little uh, refinement. But first, the Dirac operator. Now, let's start with some history. Here is a little bit of history. And history goes back to William Rowan Hamilton, in the early part of the 19th century. Who, uh, can we get these? Have we put these lights up again, the ones that are... The ones that are uh, William Rowan Hamilton, who, you know, he, he was trying to find a way to go from the use of the complex numbers in dimension 2, which are a very powerful technique in mathematics, to something in dimension 3, space. And after many, many years of struggling, he finally discovered with the quaternions, you actually are in dimension 4, you have to go to dimension 4, you jump over dimension 3. Uh, and so he discovered the quaternions, and of course the fundamental property of the quaternions, which is a big breakthrough in mathematics, was that you have to have a non-commutative multiplication. So here I remind you the quaternions are like the are algebra with the real numbers, but they're four-dimensional, so they're two-dimensional the complex numbers. So instead of having just one and i, you have one, i, j, and k. And i, j, and k all have the similar property, their square is minus one, and every pair i, j anti-commute, and the product of i and j is equal to k, and so on cyclically. So there it's a very beautiful algebra, and you can Write all the formula down in one equation. Just say that ix plus jy plus kz squared is just minus the sum of the squares. That encapsulates all the formula for you. Now, Hamilton, so he made this brilliant discovery, and uh, on a bridge in Dublin, he inscribed that there's a little plaque saying, when I crossed this bridge on the such and such a day in 18, whatever it was, I had this flash of inspiration, and suddenly the whole theory fell into place. Uh, and he spent the rest of his life working in Quaternions, and he thought that was a really fundamental discovery in mathematics. Interestingly enough, people after that thought, well, he wasted his time, really. Quaternions are quite interesting, but not as fundamental as he thought. They are a good example of non-commutative algebra, which developed into algebra. But he wanted to apply it to physics, and they thought he was mistaken. Well, actually, recent developments in physics have more and more shown that Hamilton's ideas actually were important and coming back into modern physics. But anyway, let me go on with the history. He observed uh, from this algebraic statement about the square uh, being equal to the norm uh, that if you just replace the variables by the formal partial derivatives, d by dx, d by dy, and d by dz, then obviously, in exactly the same way, you get the square of a first order system of differential operators equal to the scalar operator, the Laplace operator, scalar times the unit matrix, of course. Uh, and he thought, he said, and the words I've paraphrased a bit here, this should have remarkable applications in physics. Now, this was 80 years before this equation was rediscovered by Dirac and had applied in physics, and all that came in between was necessary before you can apply it. So Hamilton himself could not have used it in physics. The physics was not known. Quantum theory did not exist, and so on and so forth. But he, he realized that this formula would have profound implications, and, of course, he was right. Now, Dirac... Hamilton wrote down the differential operator. Exactly. Slightly different notation. He wrote it down and he said, this has, must have some remarkable application in physics. Oh, it's, a, I mean, it's very nice. Now, I don't know that, um, that um, Dirac ever uh, knew this formula. He doesn't, I don't know. That, I asked various people who knew Dirac and nobody says that he sort of referred to Hamilton's work beforehand. But he rediscovered it in his own way. After Hamilton... It was natural to generalize quaternions to higher dimensions. You have real numbers, complex numbers, quaternions, so people said, well, what next? Well, 
There was a generalization which was developed a few years later by Clifford, who was a very uh, brilliant mathematician but died young. Um, and the Clifford algebra, uh, which now plays a very important role in um, um, physics as well, um, it can be defined in the following way. You start off with n-dimensional space, Rn, and you define an algebra over the real numbers. Uh, uh, this algebra has generators uh, E1 to En, where these are former orthonormal basis of Rn. Uh, uh, and then you, the multiplication rule generates them multiplicatively. There's the square of each generator is minus one, and every two different ones anti-commute. So you see the analogy with, with the quaternions. This generates an algebra, uh, and uh, of course, the, again, these identities are equivalent to the single statement that says that the square of any x, x is a uh, linear combination of the Eis with coefficient of xi, uh, any, any vector has, has squared in the algebra is minus the norm squared times 1. That's the equation that gen determines the algebra. Uh, the dimension of the Clifford algebra, easily seen, is 2 to the, to the nth, because you can multiply the ei together, and when you get a square, you get minus 1, so you easily see that you get a basis. The vector space is given by all the various monomials. It has dimension 2 to the nth. Um, when n equals 1, of course, the Clifford algebra, you can just add, uh, you have to have e1, e1 squared is minus 1, and so the algebra is just the complex numbers. Uh, when n equals a 2, you get the quaternions, and the way you get the quaternions are related to this basis is that you have e1 and e2, e1 you call i, e2 you call j, and e1, e2, whose squared is still minus 1, you call k. So then you verify that the relations are satisfied. So the quaternions appear as the case n equals a 2, uh, and the Clifford algebra can be defined by all n, and what, hap what it has properties are that for this is an associative algebra. It's not commutative once you get away from the complex numbers. From the quaternions onwards, it's not commutative. But it's not usually a, di not usually a division algebra. Uh, the, the division algebras are the ones where non-zero elements have inverses. Uh, and the quater quaternions have that property, like the complex numbers. But beyond that, the Clifford algebras are not of that form. So the, the, the series stops with the quaternions if you want to construct a sort of skew field. But if you don't mind that, algebra carried on for all n. And these algebras are important. Now, this is the Clifford algebra over the real numbers. You can also take the same generators and define their uh, algebra over the complex numbers with complex coefficients, and you get a complex algebra, and both of these uh, we will use. Uh, in fact, more generally, you can define more general Clifford algebras by taking any quadratic form uh, over on R, I, Rn, Take any quadratic form, Q of x, then you can define the Clifford algebra of the quadratic form by requiring the square of any element uh, x is the value of the quadratic form on x. So I took the case when the quadratic form was minus some of the squares. But in relativistic physics, you would take a Lorentz form with 1 plus sign and 3 minus sign or other way around. That's the one you would use in physics, that one that Dirac would have used. Of course, if you take Q to be 0, the degenerate case, what you get is the exterior algebra. All the um, squares are zero, and as you know, the exterior algebra has the same dimension. In fact, as vector spaces, you could identify them, but the algebra structure is different. Um, <coughs> and also, you can, complexify, you can complexify these. Of course, you complexify, then all the different quadratic forms not with different signatures all become equivalent. So the Lorentz signature and the Euclidean signature are the same in the complex numbers. So now, uh, let me say a little bit elementary algebra, or, well, not that elementary, you've got to compute what the structure of these algebras looks like. So this is our little elementary digression. So we will do it over the complex numbers where it's easier first. Over the complex numbers, uh, you only have to distinguish between two cases, really, the cases when R, uh, uh, the dimension of R n is even or where it's odd. And here we'll focus on the even dimensional case. So in the even dimensional case, the Clifford algebra over the complex numbers turns out to be a just a full matrix algebra over the complex numbers. The dimension of the Clifford algebra is 2 to the power 2n. That is, of course, a square of 2 to the power n. So the matrix algebra has a matrix algebra on a vector space of dimension 2 to the nth. So it's the endomorphism of algebra, if you like, of the um, vector space V, where V has dimension 2 to the nth. 
and at the end of Morfield now, where it's technically really the tensor product of the vector space with its dual. And you notice that way around, but um, if you alter the vector space by scalars, by multiplying by a line, so to speak, then the, uh, the, the dual line is cancelled, it's the inverse, and you get the same result for the algebra. In other words, the uh, endomorphism of algebra of vector space and uh, is unchanged by multiplying the vector space by a line, which means it depends only on the projective space. So, going the other way around, if you start with the Clifford algebra, the algebra is defined, but the vector space is not quite canonical. The projective space is canonical, uh, <coughs> but the vector space is not up to the scale of ambiguity. So this, this uh, simple algebra is really, uh, this algebra is a really simple, uh, irreducible representation of the Clifford algebra, and there's just one. Uh, now, that because of this subtlety about the scalar factors, this leads to some topological subtleties in the geometrical applications which we'll come to later on. Uh, now, the, if you look at the structure, the orthogonal, the unity, the automorphisms of R2n with a metric, the metric is given because that's the quadratic form, um, the, uh, is the orthogonal group, the full orthogonal group, including the disconnected component. <coughs> um, it acts on this, on the, uh, this, uh, on this algebra, it acts on the petty space, because the petty space is, is functorially associated to the algebra. But, so you get a predictive representation of the orthogonal group. Now, <coughs> If you restrict to the special orthogonal group, matrices of determinant 1, or those which preserve the orientation of R2n, uh, then you get a representation of SO2n. And now, if you go to the double covering of this group, the group SO2n is well not to be simply connected. It has a double covering. <coughs> well, if n equals 1 is a special case, but unique double coverings, universal covering for n greater than 1. And, um, this, this predictive representation, the ambiguity turns out to only depend on plus or minus one. If you solve that ambiguity by going to double covering, you get a well-defined vector space representation. So the this, this spin group acts on this whole space, the space which I called V before, I've now called it S. Uh, and the S stands for spinners, and if you restrict to the things that preserve the orientation, then it breaks up into two halves, S plus and S minus, which are not distinct. If you switch orientations, they change. So the whole thing is irreducible under the full orthogonal group. But if you restrict to the special orthogonal group or the spin group, then it decomposes into two pieces. So, of course, each piece has half the dimension of the whole space. So it has dimension 2 to the n minus 1. And so the summary of this bit of algebra is that this, the spin group in dimension, even dimension, has two irreducible representations of dimension 2 to the n minus 1. These are called the half spin representations. Uh, the whole of them together make the whole spin representation. Um, now, I didn't describe for you how you construct the um, double covering of the orthogonal group. That can actually be very elegantly done within the framework of Clifford algebras. And uh, you can get the details in the papers. So the, the Clifford algebra uh, actually has even and odd parts because the, the basis vectors, well, the EIs, you multiply them to even number of times, you get a sort of sub, sub space. And the spinner group is defined as a subset of the even part uh, with some properties, and it preserves the decomposition into plus and minus. Anyway, this is a quick summary. The spin representation is constructed from the Clifford algebras and <laughs> in all dimensions. And in the lowest dimension, the first, I mean, complex case is rather easy. The Quaternion case, the spin representation is, so to speak, the Quaternion space itself when the vector matrix with the Quaternions act by left multiplication on themselves. Now, so summarizing what we said, the Clifford algebra, uh, <coughs> um, oh, in, oh, sorry, in the, uh, that was the even case. In the odd case, when the dimension is 2n plus 1, then the only difference is that this time the dimension is 2 to the power 2n plus 1, uh, and it's not the square of something, so it's the sum of two matrix algebras. <coughs> Two, this has two different representations, and the spin group in this case, uh, around, has one representation. So the spin group in odd dimensions has a representation of dimension 2 to the nth, and the, in the even case, it has two representations. And if you go over to the real numbers instead of the complex numbers, then things become a little bit more subtle. 
because the algebras have different structure. Now, here I've written out the results, the table, uh, you, and the, this time it depends on the dimension modular 8, not just dimension modular 2. This is pure algebra. Nothing to do with topology yet. So I've written down the dimension n there, and I've written down what algebra you get the Clifford algebra. So for n equals 1, you get the Clifford, the complex numbers, as I pointed out. n equals 2, you get the quaternion. Uh, now, n equals 3, you don't get, you, what you get is the quaternions plus the quaternions, two copies. n equals 4, you get the 2 by 2 matrices over the quaternion, and so on. Uh, at every stage, the dimension doubles, you see, either because you're doubling, changing the coefficient ring, or because you're changing the size of the matrix. So those go all the way up from the complex numbers all the way up to the 8. n equals 8, you get the matrices over the real numbers, 16 by 16. And then this, this repeats its pattern every eight steps by with the same fields occurring, but of course the dimensions uh, change appropriately. And notice that we could really have started the table at zero, because the Clifford algebra of R zero is actually formally well defined. Uh, it is just the real numbers, there are no EIs, but the algebra is still defined, and so really the real numbers appear at the beginning, and the first periodicity when you see them appearing again as 16 by 16 uh, matrices. Uh, so there's a mod 8 periodicity in the algebras, and similarly there's a mod 8 periodicity in the spin representations of the spinner group. The spin, so the spin representation uh, in the different dimensions, um, uh, over the complex numbers, there's only difference between even and odd. Over the real numbers, there are differences every, all the way down over mod 8, and the, in terms of whether the representation space is really complex or quaternionic, uh, or, or so on. So this, this is, you know, uh, you could verify by direct algebra, a little hard work. There are elegant ways to get it. I'll give you a reference where we try it done more systematically. But that's the fundamental uh, complication in the Clifford algebras. They are periodic with period 8. Now, having got the Clifford algebra, we, we now go to the Dirac operators, as I forecast before. So the, if you have now on in two n dimensional space, uh, we're going to deal with operators which are complex operators, uh, operators acting on complex valued objects. So we'll take spinner fields, which are functions from R2n into the spinner space, which is a complex vector space of dimension q to the n. And these, uh, then you take the operator, some ei d by dx i, the ei is the basis, you differentiate and you multiply, the ei is element of the algebra, it acts on the uh, it acts on the, what the EI do is in the change, the representation space S plus and S minus. It switches one spinner to the other spinner because EI are odd elements of the algebra. Only the even elements of the algebra preserve the, the plus and minus. The odd elements switch. So the Dirac operator D in the changes the plus and minus. And in fact, it's easy to see that the, the one going the other way, from minus to plus, is the adjoint of the one going from plus to minus. So if you like to write the whole Dirac operator, it's a two by two matrix block form where one half goes plus to minus, the other one goes minus to plus, and the whole operator is self-adjoint, with the two pieces being adjoint of each other. And the square of it, you square it, then you find, because of all the formulas, uh, minus the Laplace operator times the unit matrix. So these are the, Clifford, the, the uh, Dirac operator, which I really introduced in advance, but once you have the understanding of the Clifford algebras, you use them to construct it. And, of course, if you use the real Clifford algebras, you'll get information about reality conditions, which we will come to later. But for the moment, keep it to the complex numbers. So those are the Dirac operators on ordinary flat space. They just involve a constant coefficient, differential operators, and so on. Now, what is the relationship with the periodicity? We saw that in the complex numbers, there is a periodicity modulo 2. In the real numbers in the algebra, that are the periodicity modulo 8. I told you that Bott proved in the, for the homotopy groups of the orthogonal groups, the periodicity mod, modulo 8, which I didn't prove for you, but I told you that's what he did. And, of course, there is a connection between these two. So this is the sort of nature of the connection between the two. So let, let's consider the first the Clif complex case. You consider the Clifford algebra in the even-dimensional case, uh, it acts on the space of spinners, uh, and <coughs> the, it, the space is decomposed in two parts. Uh, I just told you the 
um, element x in the basis element um, it maps the plus to the minus part. Now, if you consider, uh, we, get, we forget about operators a moment. This is now back to the algebra. Going from the algebra to the topology. Uh, any element x in R2n gives you a map from s plus to s minus, uh, which is invertible because you square it, you get minus 1. Um, and so if you identify s plus and s minus by taking a basis, just think of them uh, as the same vector space, then you will get a matrix which represents this, uh, this map. So what it gives you is for every non-zero vector in R2n, let's say a vector on the unit sphere, a map on the unit sphere, into the invertible matrices. So the, the Clifford algebra naturally defines for you a canonical map of the unit odd-dimensional sphere into the general linear group with that part of 2 as its dimension. Now, if you put uh, <coughs> this, I claim, uh, is the bot generator of the homotopy groups of the unity group or the general linear group. I told you that unity group and general linear group are the same topologically, and the odd, the, in the odd dimensions, they're homotopy groups. That's the same maps of odd spheres into them are infinite cyclic, generally by one element. That one element is this one. This is the generator of the homotopy of all the, the groups. Um, there are no homotopy groups in even dimensions, so we don't need to write them down. They're zero. This is the bot generator. Now, for if, if n equals 1, a little n equals 1, then it's obvious that uh, 2n minus 1 is 1. Uh, 2 to the <coughs> big n, is, which is the dimension here, is 2 to the n minus 1, is also 1. So this is a map of uh, the circle into the circle. And it's the degree 1 obvious map, the identity map. So th that is the bot generator for the two-sphere, or for the, for the circle into the group. So for n equals 1, it's obviously the generator of homotopy. Now, uh, <coughs> our claim is that if you go about it the right way, uh, the, this statement leads to this statement by just multiplying. Namely, you can, instead of, if you think of uh, the, taking out n copies of the two-sphere, S2 times S2 times S2, then you, what you get is the 2n sphere, which is the compactification of R2n. And uh, if you think of every two sphere as having a point at infinity, if you removed all those points at infinity and every, th every time there, there was a, that occurred anywhere in the factor, then you would have two ways of compactifying R2, R2n, either by adding one point at infinity or by adding uh, points times lines and so on in lots of corners. And so these are really, uh, there's a close relationship between these two. And <coughs> the, the, bot, um, the bot periodicity theorem, rate, what it related was uh, the things on a space X with X times S2. Remember, that was what it said. It related the K theory of X with the K theory of S2 by just by the topological formula. If you apply that many times, then you can just get a thing which relates the K theory of the product of N2 spheres. And you get natural generators for it. You take the bot element in every factor, because to get from k of x to k of x s2, you multiply by a canonical element on the, k th on the two sphere, which was the standard line bundle given by this fundamental generator that is 18 to 1. Just multiplying them all up, you will get the bot element in the big dimension. So this is got by just multiplying up in an appropriate way from the basic generator uh, for the k is equal to 1, and the bot periodistic theorem tells us, in particular, that is the generator. So the, 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 the periodistic theorem, as I gave it to you, with x times s2, automatically, with some trivial uh, little bit, bit of modification, gives you the fact this is the generator. So you see that there's a very natural way in which the periodistic theorem leads you to the construction of the generator and its relationship with the Clifford algebra. Now, this is the complex case, and uh, there's nothing much more to be said here. This is the way the... Uh, Clifford algebras relate to the bot periodicity theorem. In the real case, of course, both sides are more subtle because they devolve uh, modular dimensions modular 8. But the principle is the same. The principle is the same. You have algebraic construction with the Clifford algebras. You have topological construction with homotopy groups. You have a map from one to the other, which is for generalization of this one to the real numbers. If you go through the right way, you will find the algebra gives rise to the topology. And the bot periodicity theorem says that it all works out. Of course, the details are a little more... They're delicate, but the principle is the same. The Clifford algebras give rise to the, the bot generators and the periodicities are the same on both sides. And then from there you go to the 
um, Dirac operators, and the Dirac operators will also acquire a periodicity module 8. Uh, and so you get a nice tie-up between algebra, topology, and differential operators. Now, that's so far all in flat space, just with constant coefficient operators and nothing else. But if you want to get to interesting geometry, you have to do this thing not in flat space, but on curved space. So you must take a, a compact ma manifold, which is, uh, has a Riemannian metric, because we worked here with metrics in R, R n. We want the manifold to be oriented, not, you don't want non-orientability, and we also want it to be spin. Now, the, the, the orientability condition, you know very well what it means for a manifold to be oriented. You take the tangent space, move it around, it never comes back with the orientation reversed. So the sort of cohomological obstruction, uh, well known in topology, which formulates that, that a certain element in the first cohomology modulo 2, which means that every time you go around a path, you get plus or minus 1, which means the orientation is reversed or not. And the condition for it to be oriented is that this cohomology class called W1, the Stephen Whitney class, is 0. But then there is a subtler condition, which means you want this, so this goes from the structure group of the manifold being the full orthogonal group to being the special orthogonal group. If you want to lift the structure group from the special orthogonal group to the double covering the spin group, you need another condition. That condition is in one dimension higher. It corresponds to elements H2, not H1, modulo 2. And that is called the second Stephen Whitney class. It belongs to a family of all classes, all dimensions. And the condition for a manifold to be spin is the second one. It's more subtle than the first one. Orientability, that has been known a long time, is rather easy. The second one is a bit subtler, which has to do with two dimensions, things not one dimension. You, you can't just do it by looking at round paths. You have to go around surfaces. But, it's, it, and it's, 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 but again, it has to do with the ambiguity in, in um, a plus or minus one ambiguity. And you'll, <coughs> you'll get into trouble if this is not. Okay, now, um, there are lots of manifolds which are oriented and not, not spin. For example, if you take the complex objective spaces, then the complex objective line is the two sphere. Uh, and that is spin. The complex objective plane is not spin. The complex objective three space is spin. So they, or they alternate. One half are spin and the other half are not. And you know, half of the manifolds in the world are spin and the other half are not, roughly speaking. So they, 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 it is a condition which is, is important. Uh, uh, in fact, that case about the complex objective spaces generalizes in the following way. Uh, every complex manifold has some topological uh, invariance associated to it. In fact, the analogs of these classes, they call the churn classes. Um, and the first churn class, uh, <coughs> if that class is uh, even as a cohomology class, it's spin. It's not, it's, it's not spin. Uh, because that first churn class reduces modulo 2 to give you the second Stephen Whitney class. Now, if you have a lifting to the spin group, then these spin bundles can be constructed over the entire space. Otherwise, you can construct them locally, and the particular spaces agree. When you try to match up the spin bundles in different coordinate patches, you get an inconsistency. So this, this is the consistency for the global existence of the spin bundle. Spin bundle S plus and the spin bundle S minus. And the Riemannian metric, as you know in differential geometry, enables you to construct covariant derivatives for vector bundles related to the metric. And so these spinners can be differentiated covariantly. Instead of having ordinary partial derivatives, which are um, flat space and curved space, you have to add a sort of little a correction term, a potential term, a zero order term, which makes them invariantly defined relative to the metric. That's what's known as parallel transport, if you do it along a whole path. Uh, and all formulae in geometry and physics involve the covariant derivative. Covariant derivative in electromagnetism involves adding these sort of uh, potential terms. So you end up then with a Dirac operator, which is defined on the whole manifold from the global sections, as we call them, this bundle. They are locally functions with values in the vector space, but the vector space is, is, is moving with the point. So it's called a section of the vector bundle. Every, every point, you have a value which lies in the fiber over that point. So like a vector field. Is a vector field, uh, is, or tangent vector field, associates every point, a tangent vector at that point. Uh, so the same thing. Every, every point, covariant derivative, associates you another spinner at that point. And it goes from S plus to S minus. 
and it's elliptic differential operator, that's a local condition. And now here you have the, 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 the it's elliptic because if you like the square is the Laplace operator and the Laplace operator is par excellence, the classic example of an elliptic differential operator. Now the fundamental theorems of analysis tell you that if you have an elliptic differential operator on a compact manifold with no boundary, then the number of solutions of the equation df equals zero is finite dimensional. And not only that, but the, but the sort of co-kernel, or if you like, the kernel of the adjoint equation, is also finite dimensional. That's also an elliptic operator. So you have two equations, d plus of f equals zero and d minus g equals zero. These are the, um, the f lies in the plus plot spinners, g lies in the minus spinners. Uh, in both cases, they are sometimes called harmonic spinners because they satisfy not only this equation, but the second order equation, the plus equation. And so the difference of these two dimensions, d plus and d minus, is called the index of the operator. And the important thing about the index is that if you vary the Riemannian metric continuously, with a lot of choices of metric, of course, the, the, number, the, the, d plus, the operators vary. And d plus and d minus vary. They, they in fact, are, in general, um, are, are not at all constrained by the manifold. You can construct examples where they're arbitrarily high. But uh, the difference is a... Is, 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 remains fixed under all continuous perturbations. It's a topological invariant. And the reason is that um, uh, this corresponds to sort of the zero eigenvalue of the self adjoint operator to the square, and uh, the, the non zero eigenvalues of these two match up. So what happens is that uh, if, if you move around, a zero, non zero eigenvalue can, can become zero, the dimension of the null space jumps. When that does so for this equation, Exactly the same thing happens for the other equation, so they cancel. So the, the net result is that even though the dimensions of the null spaces can change, the difference of the dimensions does not change. And therefore, the index is a topological invariant, and therefore it is uh, at least theoretically possible, or ho you hope to calculate by topological methods, and that's the problem that the index theory sets out to solve. And that is a theory which leads you to uh, complete formulae for the indices of operators of this kind and of more general operators of, of similar type. But this is the, the, this is the fundamental problem. So here is the example showing you how if every manifold of dimension 2n is spin, there is a topological invariant defined by analysis, which is the what's called the spinner index of the manifold, if you like. Now, no, that's the point. The index, the, the dimensions depend on the Riemannian metric, but the index is not. The difference of the dimensions of the two sides cancels, and the, Riemannian, the, the answer is only depends on the, strictly speaking, on the differentiable structure of the manifold. Um, so it's a topological quantity, differential topological quantity, which you can expect to get by a nice formula, for example, a nice integral formula, and such integral formulas exist. Now, so this is the. Um, Problem: the Dirac, the Dirac operator is the prototype of elliptic differential operators, but in fact, it's much more than the prototype, because once we've gone through the bot periodicity theorem and the K-theory, which emerges from it, and the analysis of elliptic operators and so on, the, it turned out that the Dirac operator is the fundamental operator for this theory. If you want to calculate the index of any elliptic differential operator, it turns out that with enough uh, technical apparatus moving around, you can reduce it always to the case of a suitable generalization of the Dirac operator. So the Dirac operator, just because the bot generator generates all, all maps, follows by, not trivial arguments, but follows that every elliptic differential operator, in a sense, is a Dirac operator of some kind, and therefore a special case gives you the general case. And therefore you can solve all of them if you can solve this one. So that's sort of the nutshell so the index theory is, is a development of how you carry this program out. It takes a lot of work, but the ideas are all there. The bot periodicity uh, and the Dirac operator are the fundamental operators. Everything else is built up from, from those. There's nothing more, nothing more subtle than those. Now, notice that the Dirac operator is a first-order system. And we, you might think that first-order systems are very special and you know, higher-order differential operators could be much more complicated. But as we've seen in the proof of the bot periodicity theorem, where we gave that linearization argument, we know very well that you can reduce higher dimensional differential operators 
first order systems, and that this, this, this is a first order system. Now, that's sort of all I will say about the general theory of elliptic operators and the Dirac operator over the complex numbers and how you get. And we leave aside what the formulas are, there's a lot of work, very interesting, but I want to now to sort of give you a different side of the story about what happens over the real numbers. Now, over the real numbers, there are some new features, and what's interesting is the new features. Um, and what, what are the new features? Well, the new features have to do with this mod 8 periodicity instead of mod 2. And, of course, the Clifford algebra, the bot periodicity, and the K-theta all are appear in this refined form with the mod 2 information. Now, what I want to do is to give you some interesting examples of these mo new features which involve mod 2, just to show you, you know, how concrete they are. I won't go into the general theory, but show you what the, the, the kind of things that happen. Now, let's, let's look at the uh, bot's results on the homotopy of the orthogonal group. And so we see these numbers. Uh, as you go from 0 to 7, that's the period 8, then the homotopy groups in this notation occur in the first two cases, you get a z2. In the next case, you get a z, 0, z, three zeros, and another z. Now, the two integers are really essentially the same as the, two, the integers which occur every second dimension in the complex case. Now, they only, only occur every fourth one because, so to speak, uh, the minus sign comes in and kills off the other one in the real case. But the first two are the two interesting ones, which are mod 2. Now, notice where they come from. They start off in pi 0. I, I, like, I like to count, start with 0. Like some buildings, you know, you count to the ground floor is 1. Uh, I think Americans count it as 1. In Europe, we count, we count it as 0. Here, you call it G. Well, uh, and so the 0 one is important. See, what is pi 0? Well, usually, what pi 0 means uh, of a space is the number of connected components. Okay, if a space is connected, pi 0 is 0. Uh, then pi 1 is to do with loops. But pi 0 is the number of components. Now, the orthogonal group has two components. And therefore, that's the first Z2. The first Z2 has to do with the two components of the orthogonal group. And you remember when I talked before about the um, condition of orientability, I said that had to do with uh, first Stephen Whitney class being zero. And that's this Z2 here, because it the orientability distinguishes between the two orientations of a space, which is the difference between determinant plus one and determinant minus one. And the second one is it comes from the fundamental group of the orthogonal group, which is a special orthogonal group, which is of order 2, which leads to the S spin group. The spin group, the spin, belongs to this second Z2. The second Z2 is to come to spin. The first one is to do to orientability. So they are both things we understand very well in the bottom dimension. The theorem of periodicity says that they reproduce themselves. These phenomena appear again every eight dimensions up. But if you want to understand the first case, you stop at the bottom. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you examples in as low a dimension as possible of interesting phenomena associated with the Dirac operators in, in these dimensions and where you'll see what Z2 does. And they're actually rather interesting, not trivial. Now, you can't get much lower down than dimension 0 or 1. Um, now, let me make some remarks about real differential operators. Real operators. But a real differential operator, if you like, is simply a... Um, uh, involves the differential operators with real coefficients. Now, I'm going to talk about two cases. I call them Roman 1 and Roman 2 because there are going to be some other ones and 2s in between. The fir first case, um, we take a, a real elliptic, a self a skewer joint operator. So it acts on a real Hilbert space. Uh, it's skewer joint. T star is minus T. Now, because it's skewer joint, up to sign T and T star are the same null space, so the index is trivially zero. There's nothing. There's nothing. No index theory, okay? Uh, <clears throat> this is an odd case. But it has another interesting invariant, which is that this, this thing here. Look at the null space. The number of solutions of the equation tf equal to zero. That's a finite dimensional vector space because it's an elliptic operator. And the claim is that the dimension modulo 2, the parity of the dimension, is a topological invariant. If you perturb the operator by continuously varying it, then the null space may change in dimension but it will change only by jumps of two. These are topological invariants. And why is that? Well, again, it's a pretty simple argument. This t is a, 
uh, skew joint operator, um, elliptic, so it has a sort of discrete spectrum, in fact, uh, um, and zero is the null spectrum. But the non zero eigenvalues, because it's real and purely imaginary, because it's a skew joint, occur in complex conjugate pairs. They are i times the real number and minus i times the real number. So uh, if lambda go, eigenvalue goes to zero, of course, then the plus and minus collapse together, and you get a jump in dimension by two. That's all it is. So this is an elementary fact if we even apply to matrices. But, the, uh, <coughs> but in the matrices, you don't get anything very interesting because you eventually you, the whole everything is determined by the size of the matrix. Uh, but here, in analysis, this is interesting. The dimension modulo two of uh, such an operator, which is defined over the real and the skewer joint, is a topological invariant. So it's something like an index. And in fact, we might as well call it we'll call it the mod two index. Because in fact, if you do the thing systematically, with Clifford algebras, and you want a uniform theory for all dimensions, you'll define an index, quotes, which sometimes takes values in integers, sometimes takes values mod two, and they change in every eight step. So this is part of a general theory. But anyway, that's the dimension modulo two is topological invariant. It's the simplest topological invariant you can think of. And so uh, it's interesting to question will be, how do you calculate this? This is another example of an index problem. How do you calculate? If you do this thing on a manifold, uh, how do you calculate this mod two index without, of course, doing the comp I mean, you can always solve the problem. If you solve it explicitly and find all the solutions, you solve the problem. But of course, it's much too hard to solve differential equations on curved manifolds in general. So the topological theorem is much more powerful. You can do get the answer without doing any work. Now, here's an example. Okay, and it can't be simpler than that. Take your manifold in dimension one. There only is one manifold, really, it's the circle. Uh, take the circle uh, and the operator, uh, the Dirac operator in dimension one, is just d by dx. Uh, d by dx is a real operator. It has real coefficients. Coefficient is one. Uh, I'm going to make it act on ordinary functions, so uh, periodic functions on the circle, x plus 2 pi. The eigenfunctions of this, we all know, they are the exponential functions. It's all i in I n x, n is an integer. And the eigenvalues are, of course, i times the integers. The null space has dimension one, so the mod 2 index is one. Okay, rather dull, you might think. Okay, let's, let's just vary this a bit. Suppose now you take um, antiperiodic functions, functions which differ, uh, go by, change by sign as you go around my circle. Then the eigenfunctions are no longer given by the integers uh, in exponents, but the in half integers, n plus a half. So now the eigenvalues are half integers, and zero is missed out. So there's no null space. In this case, the mod 2 index is zero. You see, there are two cases, and one gives you one, and one gives you the zero. There are two possibilities. They both exist. <clears throat> and now, wh what's actually the explanation of this? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I mean, they're very simple. Anti periodic function, antiperiodic function. But remember, an antiperiodic function can be well understood by going to the double covering uh, of the circle. And <clears throat> as you go around halfway around, you, you pick up a factor. So th th they're not that different. Now, so let's, let's think about... I said that d by dx was the Dirac operator on the circle. Well, actually, it is, but there's a subtlety, you see. The d by dx is the Dirac operator on the circle, but I told you that you have to choose a, you have to make a manifold spin. And the choice of, now, when, not only do you have to, manifold has to be spin, but you have to choose a spin structure. Like, manifold being orientable is one thing, but manifold being oriented is another thing. You choose one of the two possibilities. Similarly, with a spin structure, you, can, you know there is a condition how it's to be spin, something vanishes. But once you've got the condition being spin, you've got to make a choice of spin structure. That means lifting of frames to the uh, covering group. Uh, and if the manifold is uh, not simply connected, there's more than one choice. And for the circle, there are just two choices of spin structure. And the two choices give you essentially the two examples I've just given. They're both really the Dirac operator, but they're for different spin structures. And we can describe the spin, different spin structures in a way uh, geometrically without writing any formula down. See, this, the circle bounds the disk. Okay. Now, if you have a spin structure on the disk, then you can believe me, the spin structure on the disk will induce a spin structure on the boundary. Of course, the spin structure on the disk involves the, um, the two-dimensional plane, so it involves the group SO2 and its double covering. But on the boundary, it's just one-dimensional. So the, the group O1 is one point, O2 is two points, so it's just 
But nevertheless, and you go from interior to the boundary by getting rid of the normal vector. So the normal vector goes round and does something interesting. So it turns out that if you have a spin structure on the circle, it, given a tune advance, it may or not may not be possible to extend it to the interior. In other words, the spin structure on the boundary may or may not be the restriction of a spin structure in the interior. The spin structure in the interior is pretty dull because the interior shrinks to a point. And so there are two spin structures, in fact, on the circle, one of which extends to the interior and one of which does not. And how which is which? Well, um, we, we know that the, each of them gives rise to the Dirac operator. We have the two cases. We have a mod 2 index. In one case, it's zero. In the other case, it's not. Now, by a bit of general analysis, which has to do with solving differential equations with boundary conditions and so on, which I won't go into, you can show that the, um, the spinner index, the mod 2 index, is a, a sort of, um, invariant of what's called spin cobordism. Precisely, in, in this case, not much. It just says that if it bounds, it's zero. So the ones which bound are zero, the ones which don't bound are not zero. And that's the distinction. Those are the two cases. And this is an example of what happens in higher dimensions as well. But on the circle case, you can easily see it. One spin structure is you take the circle and you take the double covering, which has two copies of the circle. The other one is you take the circle, double double covering, which is one circle going around twice. And one of those extends and the other one does not. And you've got to think very hard which extends and which does not. Um, and it turns out that the one which extends. Well, you look at the answer. It works backwards. Let's see. The one which extends it has the one index zero. That's the sort of anti-periodic one. Uh, it's not, you wouldn't think it extended, but that has to do with the subtlety. When you restrict from the boundary to the interior to the boundary, you have to allow for the fact that the unit norm will go, make one turn round. If you look at it very carefully, you'll see that it fits in. So here is a very good example. There are different spin structures. You choose the spin structure. The mod 2 index will vary. And that is related to the geometry of the circle and of the, the disk in this case as well. So that's a very obviously non trivial even in dimension one. You've got to think hard. And of course, yeah, the general theory says this phenomenon is going to reproduce itself in every dimension um, multiple 8k plus 1. So that ex explains the example of the first Z2. Now, what about the second Z2? That's a little bit, little bit subtler. Well, it's not that much subtler. So this is a case, what I call Roman 2. This time we take an uh, operator T, which is uh, antilinear, uh, <coughs> T star equal minus T. And this time we'll assume that the, um, liter the Hilbert space we're acting, think of it as a real space, but has an additional I on it. So it's, if you like, the real space underlying a complex Hilbert space. But T is not a complex linear operator. It's antilinear. It anti-commutes with I. OK, such things will exist. Now, in that case, the, if you have the null space of T, it's a fundamental space, uh, and it has uh, an action of I on it, because you see I anti-commutes with T, so uh, it, it will preserve the, um, the null space. So the null space will automatically be complex, automatically have even dimensions. So the mod 2 index for this operator is obviously zero and not interesting. But if you go one stage further, although the spa null space is complex, you can do more than that. Uh, if you have a, an eigenvector, eigenvalue, which is not zero, again, they occur in complex conjugate pairs. And uh, on another eigen, lambda eigenspace, you can define the operator j, which is essentially the normalized version of t. And that anti-commutes with i. So if that, if that, when you go down to the, um, if the eigenvalue goes to zero, what happens? This gives you a j on the null space. So the null space becomes not only complex, but quaternionic. And therefore, the dimension over the complex numbers uh, is even. So now we see we can define a second invariant, which is the, <coughs> the complex dimension of this null space mod 2. And that is a, the second invariant. It's an invariant. So the, the first one really distinguishes between the real numbers and the complex numbers. The second one distinguishes between the complex numbers and the quaternions. Those are the first two algebras in the list of Clifford algebras. So you see, it's not a, not a coincidence. So the, the, the null space would become quaternionic uh, if you added an, I mean, <coughs> if the, uh, the, the difference in dimension goes up by two. The bits you add are quaternionic. So let's get an example of such a thing. It shouldn't be too hard. And where will you get an example like this? It has to be in dimension two, or two mod eight. So where we'll get an example, we will go to a, a, a Riemann surface. Dimension one, you've only got one, it's the circle. In dimension two, we've got more choice. We have Riemann surfaces, which is 
a surface of genus G, a surface with G handles. And of course, you call it a Riemann surface because when you give it a, a Riemannian metric, it automatically has a com complex structure. You can do a complex analysis on it, so it's a bit more interesting. So on, in the case of a Riemann surface of genus G, we will try to do everything in terms of the complex analysis on the Riemann surface. Now, what is a spin structure on a Riemann surface? That's a bit more subtle than in the real case. It turns out that in this case, as it happens in all complex manifolds, really, a spin structure can be defined in the following way. On a complex manifold, in particular on the Riemann surface, there is a complex line bundle, and the, the fiber at any point is just the dual of the tangent line. The tangent line is the one-dimensional vector space, and it's dual, it's called a cotangent vector, if you like. It's, it's called, uh, and the, for those form a line bundle called the canonic, canonical line bundle. Um, that in higher dimensions, you take so to speak, the exterior power of the tangent space, the volume form, if you like. Uh, <clears throat> but it's the complex volume form as opposed to a real volume form. Real volume forms have to do with real bundle and orientation. Complex volume forms have to do with the spin. And now the spin structure, what it is, is a choice of a square root of the canonical line bundle. You see, and the, taking a square root might or might not be possible sometimes in general, but it is possible if the canonical bundle has a degree, even degree in some sense, and in this case, the it is known that the degree is 2g minus 2, it's an even number, the Euler number. So, so um, you can find such square roots, and if you choose a square root, a choice of square root is a spin structure. Now, um, I told you, if you choose one square root, that, 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 that's another, you get another one, a different one, by multiplying it, these are multiplicative line bundles, by a, um, the square root of the trivial bundle. The square root of the trivial bundle is, is not necessarily trivial. <laughs> it means that you go around a closed loop, instead of getting plus one, you, you may get minus one. And so, in fact, the, the square roots of the trivial bundle correspond to the first cohomology with mod two coefficients. Every closed loop you assign plus or minus one. And the first cohomology with mod two coefficients on a uh, surface of genus G is uh, just the, uh, has uh, two to the two G uh, choice solutions because it's a, it's a uh, first cohomology has rank two G uh, over the integers of the integers modulo two. So that's in fact two to the two G spin structures on a Riemann surface. Uh, now, the complex mod 2 index of the corresponding Dirac operator, it does exist in these dimensions, but this is invariant. It should be something which we can describe in complex analysis. And the answer is, not too surprisingly, it can be described. <coughs> Given the square root, this line bundle L, you could look at the space of holomorphic sections. Uh, uh, this, is holomorph this is a line bundle varying holomorphically from point to point. You can ask for a cross section value, which varies holomorphically, and that is. Uh, that will be your vector space and will have a certain dimension, which is finite, and that's the space of sections of this line bundle. Then you take it modulo 2. That, that gives you an in index modulo 2, which is the Dirac index in this case. So it has an entire description in terms of complex analysis. And in fact, this analysis is very ancient. Language is modern, but <coughs> these are what are called in the old days complete linear systems, divisors that goes back to Arbel and Jacobi and so on, and Riemann. And so this index theory enables one to get new um, approach <coughs> to some classical results that go back a long time, which I'll now tell you what the results are. And I won't tell you how you prove them, but once you plug them into the machinery of index theory, then it's quite a routine to, in fact, I got interested in this problem because when I was working on the general theory, um, David Mumford, who knew the algebraic geometry very well, he said to me, there are these interesting results about square roots of the conical bundle in classical algebraic geometry. And there are some funny results in there. Perhaps you can explain them by using modern theory. So I have a look at it, and of course, the explanation comes out quite straightforwardly. So these are, what are the results you get? Well, the first thing is uh, a Riemann surface of genus G has um, a complex structure can vary continuously. It has moduli. If the, if the genus is zero, you get a two-sphere that's only one complex structure. For genus one, you have the famous elliptic modulus. And in general, there are three G minus three parameters which define the complex structure by continuous variation. But in fact, the complex structures form a non-trivial space. And so you get a manifold of called the modular, the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of genus G, which has complex dimension 3G minus 3. And that space is quite interesting. 
For example, if you, it has, it's not simply connected, if you go around a closed path in that space, then um, that has some topological effect. In fact, what will happen is that you can take a square root of the conical line bundle, move it around, and you get another square root of the conical line bundle. So the, the, the modular space is, is interesting, um, but the point is that the uh, dimension, so the dimension of the space of sections of the line bundle, you can think of the line bundle as given topologically, and you vary the complex structure, um, and then the space of section will change, change, can jump. It isn't always the same for a given line bundle as you vary the complex structure. Generically, there might be no, very few sections, um, but sometimes there may be more. The number can vary across the wide range, but the parity doesn't change. That's the theorem. So the first theorem, which was known to algebraic geometers, is that the dimension modulo 2, the space, does not change. We've identified that as one of our mod 2 indices of the Dirac operator, put it into a general framework. So it doesn't change. Secondly, uh, well, uh, let me give you examples. When g equals 1, then we have an elliptic curve. Uh, the tangent bundle is trivial, it's uh, covering the plane, so the conical bundle is trivial. And so, in fact, a square root of the conical bundle is just a square root of the trivial bundle. It just co corresponds to the um, points of order 2 in the torus. It corresponds to the, uh, the trivial one, the uh, real trivial bundle 1, and the two non-trivial bundles, which are square roots of 1, the half-period point other than 0. And so there is, in fact, um, the, 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 in the case of the trivial bundle, there is one section, it's the constant section. But the other one is there are no sections, no holomorphic sections. You have to have poles. So you see that the, the, the two, the, there are four choices for the square roots, and one of them, the dimension is one, the other three, the dimension is zero, and they're different uh, topologically. And in fact, as you vary the complex structure, you'll never vary, the zero, this trivial one will never get mixed up with the other three. The other three may get mixed up, but that one won't. So that, that's genus, genus one. Now, in, in general, uh, how many square roots are there? Well, I told you there are two to the... 2g, quite a big number, but in fact, well, those square roots will uh, essentially will, well, it's like, will, will fall into two classes or, or the spin structure, let's say. There are those which, where the invariant we're talking about is 0 mod 2, those where the invariant is 1 mod 2. They're, they're topologically distinct classes. So you take a set of spin structures, which is 2 to the 2g number, and they're two well-defined sets. And those that division is topological and doesn't depend on which complex structure you're taking. As you move around in the space of complex structures, uh, these subsets may move around to themselves, and they get permitted by different paths, but they will do not mix. Well, how, what are the numbers? How many in one set, and how many in the other? Well, for genus 1, we saw there was 1 in one set, and 3 in the other. What's the generalization, you know, when you go beyond that? Anybody guess, you know, what, how do you divide the power of 2 into two sets, which are not, different, not the same? Well, the formula is, <laughs> might not get it, is 2 to the g minus 1 times 2 to the g plus 1 and 2 to the g minus 1. Those are the numbers in the two sets. And if you check, I hope that if t is 1, you get um, 1 and 3. If genus 3 is a more interesting example. Genus 3, uh, those that correspond to curves, in, a curve with algebraic curve of degree 4 in the plane without singularities has genus 3. And moreover, the uh, canonical uh, line bundle has sections which are given by straight lines in the plane. A straight line of the plane meets. Oh dear, I must, you can't use that hand. A straight line of the plane meets the curve in four points because it has a degree four. Um, a square root of, of a line bundle it corresponds to sorry, uh, halving the number of points. So, if you take a line which meets the curve in only two points, each with multiplicity two, that corresponds. Well, it's a whole of bitangent. Those correspond to the square roots of the conical bundle, which have a section. If they didn't have a section, you wouldn't see them. Uh, and so, in fact, the, the, there are, and this is a classical theorem of algebraic curves a long time ago, it's known that a curve of degree 3 in the plane has exactly 28 by tangents. And 28 is, I hope, uh, this number here. G equal to 3, well, here it is, 28 is 2 squared times 7. Uh, when you have the dimension 1, the advantage of dimension 1 modulo 2 is that it's not 0. If you only know the dimension is 0 mod 2, it might be 2, it might be 4, you can't tell whether it's 0 or not 0. In the odd case, things have to exist. So this is a, it an existence theorem, if you like. When you have the number odd, something exists. The thing that exists 
is the byte head. So this is a very nice, very good, interesting example. The numbers are not, not trivial. You draw a curve at V4 to see if you can find the 28 by tangent. There's a little challenge there. Um, <clears throat> now, the, the, um, if you want to say more, uh, you might wonder where these numbers come from. Let me just digress a little bit. This is a bit of algebra over the field. Over the What's wrong? Something going on. Ah. Not logical. Right. I think it's to do with the aerial. Yeah. Uh, where was I? Uh, if, if, um, over the integer, over the, over the field, two elements. Uh, you know there are quadratic forms you can write down, non-degenerate quadratic forms, and usually a non-degenerate quadratic form is the same thing as a symmetric bilinear form. But with the field of two elements, that's not quite true, because you see. Uh, uh, you have factors of two appearing in the, in the quadratic form, and two is a bad number of mod two. So you have to distinguish between quadratic functions and bilinear forms. And given a, given a bilinear form, non-degenerate bilinear form, there are, in fact, two different quadratic functions that correspond to it. Um, and which one is which uh, is detected by a certain invariant called the ARF invariant, which is, in fact, in this case, this quantity here. And so in one case, you have uh, these numbers, in the other case, you have that number. And they're, they're, they're the different quadratic forms. The, now, the quadratic function, or quadratic form, in this case, is given to you naturally. It is this dimension mod 2. Is, if you ask, how does it vary over, these, the, over this linear space, um, over the field of two elements, you find that it is a quadratic function of the, of the square root of the line bundle you take. And the associated bilinear form is the natural bilinear form you have in, on a Riemann surface. So this is the uh, quadratic function that is, has the half invariant. That's where these numbers come from, that explanation. So the key theorem to verify is that this, the dependence of this dimension on the choice of square root is a, is, behaves quadratically. And that actually, in some sense, persists in higher dimensions too. Uh, the, the results are now, of course, much more complicated, not as simple as this, but the same sort of phenomenon appear. So these dimensions, modulo 2, are, in this case, of Riemann surfaces, you know, um, rediscover, if you like, or reprove, or improve presentation of classical results on given surface going back a long way. And Mumford actually wrote, after my discussion with him, wrote a paper which he, so to speak, a kind of retranslation backwards into uh, finite, into algebraic geometry of this differential geometrical proof. He sort of took some of the ideas and dressed them up and got a modernized version of the original proof. Okay, now I should give you some references since I've left out all the details here. And so uh, I have not, this is not a complete list of all references in the subject. Um, for that, you need much more time, more paper. More. But here are a few which I think might be helpful to anybody who wants to look at it further. I'll tell you a bit about them. So, uh, this first paper by myself, Bart and Shapiro, uh, is called Clifford Modules. Um, and it, it is it's first, the first part of it is an algebraic um, presentation of the theory of Clifford algebras, uh, which gives all the details, everything I said here, over the real numbers and over the complex numbers, Results are not new, they go back much older. But we showed a particular presentation which we think is suitable for the topology. We then showed how it links in to the topology in terms of relating to the uh, bot maps that I talked about in a certain way. So this is a kind of algebra to topology uh, section that is there. Uh, then the second reference here, uh, now this one is actually, it would be hard to track down, uh, is a set of lectures I gave at a summer school in Italy, which was published eventually, but in the kind of proceedings of the conference, it was called Classical Groups and Classical Differential Operators uh, on Manifolds. And what, what's in there is a sort of set of, I think, maybe eight lectures, which some develops the theory of Clifford algebras, differential operators, their relationship with manifolds, and so on, index theory, and gives sketches of proofs in some detail of many of the topics I've talked about here. Um, you may be difficult to find it in that form, but if you, I think in one of my volumes of my collected works, you'll find it more easily. But I recommend it because when I look back on it, I thought, gosh, you're quite a good account. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it gave more detail than I thought, more, I mean, more interesting ideas, and it was a good, good reference. If you, don't, if you want to start from scratch and you don't know much about the subject, that's probably a good place to start to learn about the beginnings of the differential geometry without too much. It's a quite a s s small paper, so not vast amount of material, but it has a lot of the essential ingredients. 
Uh, then the number th third one down here is my, one of my papers with Singer, in a series of papers we wrote about the index of elliptic operators. It's number five, which I think is the last one. Um, and uh, it's a short paper, because it just, it just, what it does is to talk about the real case, what I've been talking about here, these mod two indices. Um, and uh, it builds on and uses all the preceding theory for the general story, just shows how to uh, tweak it a little bit to get to the real case. Now, uh, I'll just digress a moment, say something about that, because uh, let's take the, um, in the, the real index mod two, mod two the dimension. Um, that's a theorem you can have about one manifold with, a, but you can translate that into a theorem. In general, there are theorems about index theorem on a manifold, then there are index theorems about family of manifolds. So if you have vibration over some base space, then in general, you can define the index of families of elliptic operators along the fibers. Instead of being the answer being an integer, the answer that happens is an element of the k-theory of the base space. In the real case is the end of the k, real k-theory of the base space. If the base space is a circle, then you'll just get uh, elements of order two. And what happens is if you take a, 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 a skewer joint operator, you can convert it into family of operators on the circle by taking the same operator and then twisting it around by plus or minus one, so to speak. So you convert um, things which are a fixed operator mod two into things about a family. And, and here, the, the general techniques of families give you a uniform treatment which you can deduce the special case. And this is sketched in here, in both the, both the real and complex cases. The, this paper here is the one which does, in some detail, the Riemann surface example I've just given you. Um, and it uh, has, has essentially all I've said plus a little bit more. Um, this paper here is about something which I didn't have time to talk about. I ha had thought about it, but I realized I wouldn't have time. It's another example of uh, a mod two index, which is interesting, because it's even higher dimensions. Um, and, and it had an application in the web, this paper of mine with Elmer Reese, which is about vector bundles on the brickiest three-dimensional space. So the space in question is complex three spaces, six-dimensional reals, quite a bit higher than what we've been looking at here. And uh, there, uh, what it deals with is the case of the, the Dirac operator acting on a rank two vector bundle, or extended, the spinner is extended by a rank two vector bundle uh, with, with determinant one, um, which is really a symplectic space. And I haven't mentioned this, but in Bolt's periodicity, I should have said, although the periodicity is eight, there is a half stage periodicity, which, when you move along by four steps, places orthogonal by symplectic, and vice versa. The symplectic group is like the orthogonal group, but you preserve a skew symmetric form instead of symmetric form. And so the symplectic group is another of the classical groups. Bot's work characterized the unitary group, the orthogonal group, and the symplectic group. And the symplectic group is the same table as the orthogonal group, but shifted by four. And so if you shift by go to the symplectic group, you shift dimensions by, by four, and six is two plus four. So the phenomenon that appears in dimension two will appear in dimension six if you go to the symplectic situation. Now, the Dirac operators are not in the symplectic situation, but you would tensor it by a rank two vector bundle, which is determinant one, which is a quaternionic line bundle. That brings it into the symplectic domain, and the thing reproduces. So this is another example of this mod two complex dimension reappearing, and again, it has an interpretation in terms of complex analysis on this free space. And again, it can be used in terms of uh, application in algebraic geometry. It's a nice example, but obviously, it will take too much time to do it here. But that's what it's in here for. So I finished, and that's the references for you. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Right. That's right, but you see in that table, the Z2s appear um, in the beginning, in the orthogonal group. So they correspond to two components. In the symplectic group, they will appear uh, in dimension shifted up, and they will not correspond to components. They will correspond to the other homotopy group. So you see, you say to be pi 0 for the orthogonal group, it should be pi 4. So my guess is that pi 4, the symplectic group, has to be Z2. Now, the first symplectic group is, in fact, a three-sphere. Pi four of the three spheres, etc. That's the one you get to Z two. So yeah, yeah, you're right. But it, 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 the, it, it is no longer the dimension the components. It appears further up, and the correspondingly, the dimension one corresponds to dimension five in the orthogonal group, which is zero. So it, it, it fits in quite well. But you're quite right. The, the components are not 
uh, have real new different interpretation when you add four to the dimension. Don't be afraid to ask. Yes. And uh, these are the way numbers that look clear, the left dimension of the uh, space. Yes. What about the one with the massive sum of zero wing of the uh, energy? So you have uh, this one has a, a step right here, that one in space at the same time. Then uh, the distance is actually tells the topological information of the space today. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, let, let, me make, let me make a general point. Um, in general, the, the if you have an elliptic differential operator, the, the dimension of the space of solutions, harmonic objects if you like, uh, has, uh, will depend on the metric. And as you make different metrics, you can make the numbers get very, very big. Perhaps the metric oscillates very much. In the one special case, we know that does not happen. Hodge's theory says that if you take the differential form uh, with any Riemannian metric, the harmonic forms are always given by the topology, the Bessie numbers, independent of any metric. That's a very, very strict theorem. In general, they, they, they will change. For example, another example is you take, uh, uh, in connection with Lie groups, if you know, every Lie group has irreducible representations. And there's a general construction called the borel bay construction, which constructs all the irreducible representations of compact Lie groups in terms of um, sections of line bundles on certain homogeneous spaces. Um, and so these <coughs> groups act on these big spaces that are, so there are, sorry, that's, Right, different story. But anyway, the, the point is, the, in general, the metric the dependence of eigenvalues is, is you know, um, very random. And you can get examples uh, showing that even the lowest, except in dimension 2, which is special dimension 3, the, the eigenvalue, zero eigenvalue, can be made very, 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 very big. It reflects something about the metric, not so much. But the very bottom ones, or the difference of dimensions, kind of, that's a topological information. But the higher spectrum is very, depends on energy. So of course, it depends on the other properties of the metric, uh, but we, that, they're too difficult to define. We do the easy part. The, the topology is concerned only with the... And in a lot of physical applications, the interpretation of this is that in very complicated physical models, um, the, the zero eigenvalues, or zero mass, or whatever it is, um, is of something which can be topologically controlled. The other eigenvalues correspond to higher energy or correspond to other particle creations and different stored physics. But the very rock bottom part, it's topological, Gives some information which is sort of easier to catch hold of. Uh, and the index theory is about sort of the bottom step in this story. But as you vary the metric, in general, you have to remember that the, the wild variation in the eigenvalues. I don't. We'd be interested to know more. I don't. You know, how does the how do you increase the number of zero eigenvalues by changing the metric? And so the Dracar, I mean, Nigel Hitchin, his thesis worked out simplest case for the three-dimensional sphere. On the three-dimensional sphere, you can take a family of metrics which is quite a lot of symmetry, but still has some degree of freedom in one parameter. And you can work out how, as you vary that parameter, the dimension goes up, and it can go up arbitrarily large while you vary that parameter. In that particular case, you can see some geometrical features. But in general, it's a very hard question. Yeah.